Welcome to another episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? Except today I have a special treat for you. It's What Are You Playing? What Are You Writing? I'm Karen E. Osborne, author of Getting It Right and Tangled Lies, which came out in uh, July 22nd. And, and my new book is coming out, Reckonings, on June 16th, 2022. I'm so over the moon about it, but not as over the moon I am about introducing you to this exceptional, exceptional man. So Mike, I've known Mike for a long time. I've known him since he was like, I don't know, 16 or something, but he's turned out really well. <laughs> In spite of that. Yeah. He is um, professor of jazz. He's the director of jazz studies at Ithaca College. He is a marvelous uh, saxophone jazz player and author of two books. That's how we made it onto this show. He's an author of two books and his latest is Jazz Improvisation Using Simple Melodic Embellishment. And you have to see the cover. Did you, oh, I forgot to ask you, did you bring the cover with you, the book with you? Oh, I could go grab it over there. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I'll keep talking to everybody. And if you could go grab the book, because I want you to see this awesome cover. And while he's there, take a look at the mural that's behind him of all of those famous jazz musicians and singers that he has in his studio. And then hold it up a little closer to the camera. There it is. And look yeah. at it. Doesn't he look cool? That's him playing. <laughs> Who's the artist? Mike, uh, who did the art? That would be me. Um, believe it or not, this is a painting. Uh, the cover of this is a painting that I did in college. I was taking an art class and I was trying to do something. I'm not even going to tell you what style I was trying to paint this in because it totally did not grab that style. In fact, <laughs> I think I think I got something like a C on this on this project. And then I was so upset that I threw the painting out. And then uh, my mom discovered it. In the, in the garbage and she salvaged it and it's now up in her living room you've probably seen it it's oh, up yes. in the living room and uh so so i appreciate the fact that that my mom uh saved it and now i i've uh, and it's i did, did a little playing around around on the edges but it's actually in paint I actually paint with oil painting wow. and which is probably the only oil painting i've ever done but it is a self-portrait it is me very nice very nice and and tell us quickly about the mural that's behind you Oh yeah, this is a this is an amazing mural. Um, there's a, a local artist named uh, Bill Benson who painted this for a restaurant in town. I don't know, maybe 25 years ago or so. The the restaurant was called Mad. Uh, when I say in town, by the way, I mean Ithaca. I assume everybody knows I'm in Ithaca because I'm the director of New York. Ithaca College. Yeah, Ithaca, New York. Not Michigan. There is a there are other and not Greece. You know the country. <laughs> um, so this painting is a huge mural. You can see two of the parts, but there's a third part over there that you can't see. And uh, it was uh, fitted to this restaurant. There was a, uh, this wonderful dessert case. Everybody knew about the dessert uh, case in this restaurant. And then if you looked over the dessert case, uh, just over the little slot to where the kitchen was, was this mural. And they had live jazz at this restaurant all the time. And then about two years before the restaurant closed, my wife Catherine and I started uh, performing there uh, every week. I was on sabbatical and it was just a great way to spend some some time over the sabbatical was was working on on great tunes to to play there so uh and the the artist uh included all these wonderful jazz musicians as part of the uh the mural so there's two billy holidays over here and and ella there and louis armstrong and big spider beck and um uh, sydney bechet and then over there is charlie parker and miles davis and uh um who else is over? John Coltrane. You can't see all those in that part, but yeah, someday you'll come in here and, and, and visit us. Because uh, uh, well, when the restaurant closed, uh, the, the, the owner of the restaurant didn't know what to do with the painting because he was about to leave the country. So he, he literally just had it in his garage and he said, I don't know what to do with this painting. I'm about to leave in a week. <laughs> do you have any interest? And, uh, and we said, yeah, we'll, this is the only piece of art we've ever bought. We bought it from the owner because uh, we, my, my wife's, Mother is a wonderful artist, so our house is filled with art, but we've just never bought oil paintings before. This is the first time we bought one. And so it's, be so, and then the pandemic hit, it became the backdrop for all of my online teaching. Isn't that great? That yeah. is awesome. That is awesome. It's meaningful painting to us. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All your um, inspirational 
artists that came before you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, Mike, I really want to hear about how this book came about. And guess what? Mike is going to play some music for us. You know? But this is a, a show about reading, not just writing. So I wonder if you've read anything interesting that you could share with our audience. Well, I thought I would share two things. Um, because I am a musician, I thought it would be it would be a little crazy for me not to share the thing I'm listening to right now, mm -hmm. um, because I'm I'm listening to something that's really amazing. And then I'll share I'll share a book with you also. The thing that I've been listening to is by um, another uh, wonderful, strong black woman musician um, who, uh, like yourself, strong black woman who I just just impresses me to no end. But not and a musician, not, not a, a musician. <laughs> no, <laughs> another strong black woman uh, who is a marvelous saxophonist and singer named Camille Thurman. And uh, I feel very fortunate that I reached out to Camille a couple months ago and she's going to be a guest artist at Ithaca College this year. So she's going to come and, and play and work with our students. So the, the recording of hers that just blew me away, uh, she was invited to participate in this weekly series by a pianist named Emmett Cohen, and Emmett uh, does these living room concerts. He did them all through the through the pandemic, and uh, living room concert fifty five. Emmett Cohen and fr Emmett Cohen and friends, mm -hmm. and uh, Camille um, is it's uh, it's it's an entire concert. But the tune that most just instills joy, just constant mm -hmm. beauty and joy, is called Red Top, Little Red Top, and it's a blues, but it's a humorous blues, and it's silly, and it's fun, and it's beautiful, and and uh, wait till you hear Camille Thurman. She's she's an amazing uh, singer. She's also a, just a fantastic saxophonist. She just does it all. She plays with Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, and and um, wow. so yeah, she's she's the real deal. That's a great recommendation. Thank yes, you. right. You, you'll you won't have a better eleven minutes of your day. I promise you. Go find Camille Thurman, Emmett eleven Cohen. Eleven minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, Red Top, and and right. listen to the whole thing from beginning to end because it just keeps getting better and better. And, uh, and then like, wow, I just haven't heard anything that good ever. So, um, and then for uh, actual book, um, I, this is one that I uh, recommend. It's um, Thelonious Monk, Life and Times of an American Original by Robin D.G. Kelly. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Thelonious Monk's music, but he also had a, a interesting, fascinating, difficult um, life. Um, he really was an American original in so many ways, and he, his music continues to inspire. Unlike a lot of other um, jazz composers, he, he was not particularly prolific. Um, yeah. you know, Duke Ellington wrote thousands of, of pieces. Um, Polonius Monk maybe wrote 80 over his whole life, but every single one of them is compelling, and almost all of them are jazz standards that every jazz musician has to know. So I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard a bunch of them. I'm sure everyone's heard a few of them. They may not even realize that a lot of them are Thelonious Monk. And the other reason I like this book is because I have a, the tiniest of connections with the, with the author, Robin D.G. Kelly, which is that about 20 years ago, he had somehow heard through the grapevine that I had a book of Thelonious Monk transcriptions. And he, asked, he, he reached out to me and asked if he could buy them. I said, well, I can't sell them to you because it's not my intellectual property. It's, you know, my, my professor, Bill Dobbins, had done all these transcriptions himself. They were in his handwriting. I had, I had asked Bill if I could copy them for my own study purposes when I was a student, and Bill let me copy them. So I said, I, I can't sell it to you, but I can give it to you. I can make you a copy if you're interested. So, um, so then what he did is he sent me an, an autographed copy of one of his earlier books, Yo Mama's Dysfunctional. And uh, so it's a nice, nice inscription in this. He, he also included another article in here in, in, in the book that I thought was great. And uh, only later did I find out that he's really a very well-known author. I, I've impressed a few people by saying that I know this author, even though I don't actually know him. I just think, I think the world of his, of his writing. And, and if I played this much of a part in his research for when he then later did the Thelonious Monk uh, biography, then I feel... Uh, very gratified because it's a clearly really you did book. clearly you did yes thank you excellent. That is excellent all right so tell us a little bit about the book that you the books your two books and then uh, what you're going to play for us oh sure um so the first book i didn't write all of i wrote a few chapters i collaborated with uh, a colleague of mine chad west he and i wrote a few chapters each and then we also uh 
got some of our friends and colleagues to write additional chapters. Uh, that's about jazz pedagogy, about teaching school jazz for, mm -hmm. you know, for middle school and high school kids. And because uh, a lot of our students at Ithaca College are wonderful musicians. They're going to be great teachers. We have an exceptional music education program, but they, they many of them have not a lot of experience in jazz. So that book was designed for future music educators who uh, are going to go out and maybe teach band or teach orchestra or teach choir and, and need a little bit of experience teaching jazz. This one is all on my own. This one was um, inspired in part by Bill Dobbins, but really the inspiration was a, a great saxophonist named Lee Konitz. And Lee Konitz uh, is one of my heroes. He came, uh, actually, this picture of, one of the reasons I like this, this painting is that um, off to the side, <laughs> from, this is, it was actually a photograph that I, I painted from a photograph and off to the side was Lee Konitz was standing there because it was during a rehearsal with Lee Konitz when he came to school. It was probably 1990 or something like that. And uh, Lee's an amazing improviser, um, very inspirational. He, uh, back in, I think, 85, was interviewed by Downbeat Magazine. And one of the things that he said in this um, was that one of, the, one of the best ways to learn to improvise is to start with a simple melody and then gradually embellish it more and more and more. And that's an instruction I had also heard for years. I had heard that from various mas master classes that I had gone to when I was, you know, from, from the very moment I started being interested in jazz in sixth and seventh grade, I would go to these master classes where I was the youngest kid there. I didn't know anybody or any what was going on and I would hear that. I didn't really know what it meant. Mm -hmm. So um, when I got into college, I was studying uh, traditional air quotes, classical music theory, and uh, studying jazz with uh, Professor Dobbins, all of a sudden these two things came together and I realized that, that both Charlie Parker, one of my idols on saxophone, and J.S. Bach, one of my idols in composition, even though they're several hundred years apart, yeah. they were doing largely very sim using very similar techniques. They were sort of doing the same thing, that they were taking simple melodies and embellishing them, making basically taking a a what's a very simple melody and making it more beautiful mm -hmm. by by uh, finding cool ways of, of embellishing it and many of the techniques are the same between Bach and and Charlie Parker I, mean, I could give you a little example which I have my my keyboard here because I, I you know when I was teaching if you think about a melody that you know probably very well mm -hmm. over the rainbow mm -hmm. you can leave out some of the notes and still recognize the melody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with, with, you can recognize that melody, but it's missing some of the embellishment notes. In music theory terms, we might call these passing tones. That note in the middle there is a passing tone. Mm -hmm. So this is what you're teaching in the book. This is what you're explaining in your book. In the book, we go through all these different techniques in, in, uh, to talk about these are some of the techniques that have been used, and here's how to practice them. Here's how to learn them. And then you, each uh, student, whether they've ever improvised before, can go through it and say, well, this is how I would then take a simple melody and embellish it. Embellish and it. then, mm. yeah, so that's the, uh, that's the concept. And um, nice. it's... Yeah. Yeah, is it it's, so it's audio that goes with it, or it's it's just written word? Yeah, there's hundreds of, of audio files. So if someone wants to learn to improvise, you can go to my website and download all the the uh, uh, we call them playalongs. Or in my day, we called them Jamie Abersalds because Jamie Abersold was the one who created play along or sing along type of recordings that were became very popular. He didn't originate that, but he was the one who popularized it as a way of teaching yourself to um, to learn jazz and to learn to improvise. And what's your website for our audience? MikeTitlebaum.com. And spell your last name. T I T L E, like the title of a book, B A U M. That Mike Titlebaum. Titlebaum .com. So, what are you going to play for us, Mike? I get to play for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I could I could use the famous Miles Davis quote, which is that I could play it first and tell you about it later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, you excuse me. I've discovered that uh, I have to turn the mic down a little bit yes. because the go, mic, go if, it's, it. if it's if it's geared towards my voice, it's going to be too loud for the saxophone. I have this. I like this mic. I think it sounds. I think my voice sounds good. I think the saxophone sounds good. But okay, I'm going to turn down my voice here. All right. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Can you tell us very briefly, because very briefly, what did we just hear? That was All of Me, one of the great jazz standards. Did you, did you recognize the tune? I did, yes. Uh, yeah. One of my old, uh, one of my favorites. I love to play uh, old jazz standards. It's fun. It's fun to play songs like that because uh, I, I like the idea of people recognizing the melody and then recognizing that I'm not playing the melody anymore yes. and that I'm, I'm trying to sort of uh, thread this needle between uh, the song and my expressive voice, my own personal voice, the, what yeah. I can give to the song. And I think that's really what's, what's uh, beautiful about jazz is that you're really sort of on, uh, you're not on either extreme. You're not playing the melody exactly as it is. You're not entirely expressing your own voice without any regard for the melody. You're trying to find this, this middle line. Mm-hmm. And that, that goes along with many of the topics in the, in the book because one of the, um, I, I talk about a lot of, um, what would be the, the word, like continua. Is continua plural of continuum? <laughs> Many continua. One of the continuums <laughs> I, I, I talk about is uh, improvisation versus composition. On one hand, you've got composition. On the other hand, you've got improvisation. And they feel like very different things. But actually, it's more like two sides of, of the same coin. You know, improvisation is just like composing quickly and composition is like improvising slowly. That's not my own quote. I stole that from a buddy of mine named Chris Jens. That is awesome. That is awesome. So, um, so if we wanted to hear more of your music, that's also they can go to your website and or how did, how could they purchase? Like they just fell in love with you and they oh. not only want your book, but maybe their book is not quite what they're interested in. What they'd like to do is hear more music. So where can they find your music? Sure. Um, I have a lot of YouTube videos. That's probably the best way is I have ah. a bunch of things on, on YouTube. I, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I started recording a lot of things uh, just down in the basement by myself. Um, I would overdub three or four different, different parts sometimes on the, um, on the keyboard, sometimes on saxophone, sometimes on trumpet. Did a few things with my wife, Catherine, where she's singing. Uh, my daughter Hannah came over, we did some things and then life kind of got in the way and we had some, some issues we had to deal with, uh, which prevented me from doing the videos, but I did about 18 of them before I had to, I had to stop. Uh, one of them actually, one of my favorites was I collaborated, uh, remotely with an old buddy of mine named Jason Robert Brown. Uh, uh, theater composers know Jason's music really well because he's won a couple of Tonys for shows that he's 
uh, written it. He and I went to school together. So uh, I, I reached out to him and I said, let's collaborate on something. We're all in this pandemic. And he sent, just sent me a piano recording that for me to play along with. And he, it was um, a Beatles tune. It was uh, When I'm 64, but he did it in seven. So he called it When I'm 74. <laughs> so you could, if you, you could look on YouTube and you can find that. And I, and then I got, because it was fun, I got creative and I started doing some video editing and turned it into a whole video project too. Oh, that sounds so fun. So you can find Mike, Mike Teitelbaum, MikeTitlebaum.com. You can also find Mike Teitelbaum on YouTube. I hope you've enjoyed this very special edition of what are you reading? What are you writing? Um, you know, I think that artists, there's so many parallels between the art of writing, the art of music, the art of painting. You know, there's just many things that we as artists uh, have in common. And then you as a reader and a listener, I think that you will enjoy both with having met with Mike. So hmm. say goodbye. Till next time. Bye. Thanks, Karen. Love talking to you. Thank you, Mike.